in the book, and you may have seen it, uh, I actually did a coroner's report uh, of the cause of death from my first investment. And <laughs> a lot of us will be like this. We think investing when we first start out is the hot ticket to get money fast. But investing isn't that. Investing is, you know, investing slowly over time. For me, your human capital, the energy you put out there into the world, whether it's your job, your business or whatever, that will always have a bigger investment than any stock return. So for me, investing in ETFs, investing in managed funds, what I've resolved is that's just where I park my money for the long term, for the Glen of tomorrow that has a decent shot of growing and outpacing inflation. So I don't have this mindset anymore that investing or buying a share will make me rich. No, I need to do the best I can to add value to the world, to produce capital, live on less than I earn, and then park the rest for the glen of tomorrow. My financial plan is really simple, and I'll, I'll walk you down this garden path. It's a three-point right. financial plan. The first one is live on less than I earn. Yep. The second one is be a generous giver. The third one is invest the rest. We all have this budget baggage, well, some of us do, uh, that we wake up and we're like, oh, I actually really want to invest in my future. I'm, I'm there, I'm resolved. Oh, but I can't because I've got budget baggage because I made a dumb decision two years ago and got a personal loan for a trip to Ibiza and you know I'm still paying that off. Like that budget baggage will hold you back from making changes faster in your life and having an agile budget. And I really think we've got to get to the mindset where when we allocate money in our budget, we have to do it with the mindset of I'm allocating this money for the glen of the tomorrow, for the bushy of tomorrow, not the glen of yesterday. And that's the problem with consumerism and society. They want you to tie up your budget for things you've already consumed. Everyone gets tied up with the execution of buying an investment. Everyone gets tied up with what's the best share, what's the best ETF, what's the best property. All that crap will sort itself out. Just focus on having good money habits and behaviors. Just focus on spending less than what you earn. You know, let's not major on the minor. And in the book, there's that thing that I drew called the Sound Financial House. You've still got to do things from the right order. You know, totally you're great. not worrying about highly speculative investments um, or, you know, investing in all this crap. If you don't have your budget in order, if you don't have your debt, consumer debt paid off, if you don't have your life insurances and your protection plan sorted, get your wills and estate plan, get your emergency fund, get your goals nailed. If you want to buy a house to live in, we want to focus on that first. If you want to rent vest and do that, well, let's get that nailed first. Then you can go and start doing whatever you want with your money. But the problem is people put the cart before the horse. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening. And now let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Do you have your money sorted out? And are you invested? Now, I don't mean roughly or vaguely. Have you really sorted out your money into an automated system today and then invested in growth assets that will secure your tomorrow? 
Do you have a written down spending plan? Have you paid off your consumer debt? Have you got your life and protection insurances in place? What about your will and estate planning? Do you have an emergency or rainy day fund that will cover you for the next three to six months if you lose your job or encounter some other work income stopping event? Now COVID's a recent great example and a wake up call for this. Because if you don't have your sound financial house built on strong, unshakable foundations, there's no point in putting the cart before the horse and investing in property or shares or crypto because, like two out of the three little pigs who built their houses out of straw and sticks, your financial house will blow over and crumble before your very eyes as soon as the winds of adversity blow and the wolf huffs and puffs. So, if like most, your financial house isn't in order and your gold-encrusted investments are resting on a fragile house of cards, where do you turn to build and or rebuild your financial foundations? Well, this is where today's very special guest, Glenn James, and his recently published book, Come to Your Rescue. Now, for most of you who love money and investment podcasts, Glenn needs no introduction. At the ripe old age of just 30-something, Glenn James is a retired financial uh, advisor with experience helping countless people get on top of their finances, and he's host of the top-rating My Millennial Money podcast, along with a family of other related millennial podcasts that don't just talk to millennials, but anyone who's keen to get on top of their money and investments. With his own personal financial success behind him, Glenn shares my passion to help you, your friends, family and others to achieve financial freedom. As you'll hear today, his informative approach is light-hearted, dry, tinged with a touch of sarcasm and fun, while still managing to cover sensitive and important topics in a very engaging way. And he's generously agreed to join us today on Get Invested to talk about his recently released book, Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested. And yes, as you can guess, I love the Get Invested part of the title. And having read it, his book is a super accessible practical guide on how to change your money mindset, get out of debt and get ahead. In simple terms, it's a practical no BS guide to getting your finances on track. Sharing his unique and life-changing approach to navigating life's major financial milestones, Glenn guides readers on topics such as dealing with debt, developing a spending plan that actually works, buying your first property, through to investing in shares and creating a financial plan that sets you up for long-term success. Filled with a diverse range of case studies and written in a very accessible, matter-of-fact style for anyone who just wants to know what works, you'll learn about getting out of debt and getting the most out of your life, realistic ways to increase your income and help balance your budget, the method, methods that lead to a safer, more stable financial future, the smart way to invest in real estate and purchase a home or investment property, and how to understand the share market, ethical investing, and your superannuation. And in true millennial style, the book includes TLDR sections at the beginning of each chapter, where TLDR stands for Too Long, Didn't Read, that gives you an easy list of points about what's in the chapter. Now, Sort Out Your Money and Get Invested isn't a dry, boring finance book. It's a crackling, entertaining, and super practical guide that outlines everything you need to do to secure your financial future. As Glenn says in the introduction to his book, he's not a writer and he hates reading, so he listens to audiobooks. He's not an economist and he hates maths. He's not a behavioural therapist and he hates getting told what to do. He's not a naturally frugal person and he hates budgets. So does this sound a bit like you? Because there's a lot of hard-working Aussies who fit this description. However, as a retired financial advisor and through his podcasts, He's in an ideal position to observe what works and what doesn't when it comes to your personal finances. He's seen hundreds of individual secrets when it comes to money, both good and bad, and how they do things. And Glenn's own struggles with wanting to spend every living cent that walks into his life has meant that he needed to create a system that works on its own and allows him to not have to think or care about money day to day while still saving and building wealth in the background. Now again, does this sound a bit like you? Well, if you relate to any of this, then you're really going to enjoy today's conversation. And to whet your appetite, Glenn talks today about many of his approaches that he details in his book, including setting up your spending plan as opposed to budgets that suck, 
the problems with what he calls budget baggage, creating a sound financial house, his simple three-step financial plan, the importance of automated systems for anything and everything alongside the criticality of habits and behaviours. And we enjoy a fun chat about what he calls loot, or living on own terms, which is his version of FIRE, or the Financial Independence Retire Early Movement, plus a whole bunch more. And in the spirit of today's conversation, Glenn Book's, Glenn's book puts together something that's clear, concise, and can be read over dinner. Glenn realises that his way of doing things with money may not be the silver bullet that you're after, but it's a way that works, and works for most people. As Glenn says, the trick is to live purposefully with your money and to have a system in place that works for you and your particular personality style. His book shows you how to set up your personal finances so that you never feel broke again. And this doesn't mean just joining a Powerball syndicate with friends at work. The book shows you step by step how easy it is to invest for your future and teach you enough that you'll feel empowered and be informed to make your own decisions. It shows you how to set up your financial life from the ground up, so you build it in the right order. Yes, he's provocative and sarcastic, which I actually find very refreshing. However, he's also extremely practical and he gives you the tools to win in all areas of your finances. So if you enjoy our great conversation today and you want to learn more from Glenn, you can grab a copy of his book, Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested, on Amazon and in all good bookstores, as well as a few bad ones, or you can get it directly from Glenn on his website, www.sortyourmoneyout.com. And if you want to start or continue investing in your knowledge, join me and many other like-minded investors in our Get Invested community right now. I send you a free and exclusive monthly email full of practical self, health and wealth wisdom that our current Freedom Fighter subscribers can't wait to get every month. It's full of investment and lifestyle tips, my personal book recommendations, apps I use to enhance life, and a whole bunch more. Just visit bushymartin.com.au and sign up at the bottom of the page, because this is just the beginning. And while we're talking about beginnings, please now enjoy this great conversation with the infamous Glenn James. Hi Freedom Fighters. Now, in my humble experience over the years, I've come across very few colleagues who share my passion to wake up and shake up hardworking Aussies to start living with intent by investing in themselves to get invested in their financial future. So when I get the opportunity to talk all things money with a fellow quiet crusader with a massive following like the infamous Glenn James of my millennial money fame, I get very excited. And today's one of those days. So welcome and let's get invested, Glenn. Hey, Bushy, and hello to all your listeners. I'm appreciating the time that uh, that you've given me, and I'm I'm just yeah, I'm pumped to have a chat about money and investing, and we'll just see where this goes, right? Exactly right. Well, we we both got a passion for the subject, mate. So uh, we, we could go down all sorts of rabbit holes, but uh, mate, uh, for those that don't know you, and you you probably have to be living under a rock in Australia at the moment not to know who you are, given the the profile you've built through your pot and the and the business behind it. But for those that don't, uh, can you just give us a quick rundown on who you are, what you do, and most importantly, why you do what you do, Glenn? Yeah, so I uh, I'll, I'll cut it short and give you the highlights. Uh, I was a licensed financial advisor for I think just over 12 years and um, probably a bit longer and uh, for 10 of those years I had my own practice uh, on the central coast of New South Wales where I live. It was primarily a um, a mum and dad practice you know in suburbia but I actually had a passion uh, and I still do have a passion for small business and a lot of the kind of my specialty was uh, small business succession and uh, succession planning for small businesses. And, but I've just got the, you know, the mindset when I'm in business that, you know, if you set up good processes, well, things will just work out. So I had really good processes in my business, which led me to, you know, helping the young person who was 19 who wanted to get good with their money, to helping the, you know, mid 40 small business owner who, you know, had a million dollar business and lots going on with succession. Or I had clients who were 80 or 90 years old uh, that needed help managing their money and doing planning. So 
I basically uh, had a lot of uh, face-to-face experience at the coalface helping uh, everyday Australians uh, with their money. And it became apparent that for me, because I'm a doer by nature, um, I'm a builder. If you know there's nothing to build, I need to move on. And I had built my practice to a point where you know, I was at the top of the mountain that I'd set for myself uh, and the view was quite good and I needed another challenge. Why? Well, I was just bored basically. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, won some industry awards, bloody printing money in the business and while all that was happening, I was sick of saying the same things over and over. So you get people that come in in their 50s and 60s going, oh, we want to retire, we want to retire which some of your listeners might be like that. Want to retire, want to retire. I need some financial advice. And it's like, well, no, you just need to have a freaking budget and spend less than what you earn. Like, (laughs) so I was getting sick of saying that. And I was also getting sick of showing friends and family and friends of friends uh, a budgeting system. And, you know, I had created what I call now the Glenn James Spending Plan, which is our online course. And, you know, it's only $99 at the moment. But at the time, I think I was charging 50 bucks for it. And I would have clients come in and like, oh, we need a budget. Yeah, you're right. Uh, can you help us? And I basically said, look, you got two options. You can spend $3,000 with me. I'll have six sessions with you and, you know, we'll stagger it out over the months and keep you accountable and all that. Or you can go online and do it yourself for $50. Like, I don't care. You'll get a result uh, either way uh, because I value my time. And I need to charge for that, but there is an option here. So, you know, I was at the kind of peak of what I'd set for myself in my own financial services business. I was uh, needing a new challenge. I was getting bored and I knew I wanted to start some type of online business. And that the start of that was the Glenn James spending plan. And then I, I started a podcast and, you know, it sucked. So I canned it. I, I went to a conference in America called FinCon and really got encouraged with this financial literacy thing online. And then I landed in Sydney, I think at the end of 2017, and I was on the runway on the plane, got phone service, sent out a text message to about seven people, hey, who wants to buy a financial planning business? And at that point, I'd kind of really wanted to do something Uh, different and online and then you know the podcast that I was doing the podcast was actually called sort your money out and that's the name of the book now but that podcast doesn't exist anymore because I thought it sucked Uh, and then I I thought (laughs) hang on I need to do more content and I need to do it more regularly because if you've got an online business and you are a content creator well you can't produce enough content and then at the time you know at the end of 2017 you know, the, the word millennial was really getting thrown out there in marketing land and all that. And I wanted to do a money podcast. And I thought, oh, hang on, my millennial money. Oh, that, that rhyme. So then started that. And I think at the time, I really couldn't find an Australian personal finance podcast for Aussies by Aussies. And I saw a gap in the market. And when I see a gap in the market, I'll drive a truck through it and give it a good shake because I'd rather go down with the ship knowing that I'd thrown everything at it. And... That's basically what I'm doing now, full time, running my Millennial Money podcast. Uh, we've got a, a business. We do the online course. We've got an online investing course. We've got a handful of other podcasts that we run. Uh, there's four staff members, and it's yeah, it's com- it's a completely wild journey. So that's what I do, um, and that's the reason why. Yeah, no, perfectly said. Uh, I'd love to dig into your own personal investment journey a little bit if we can then and, mm. t- and take us back as far as you can remember in terms of what what was your first investment and, and why did you have an interest and then uh, what have you invested in since then and and where what's the strategy behind it and where do you see it taking you? Well, it's funny. In the, in the book, and you may have seen it, uh, I actually did a coroner's report Uh, of the cause of death from my first investment. And (laughs) a lot of us will be like this. We think investing when we first start out is the hot ticket to get money fast. And, you know, sure, you you might have examples where you've got lucky and, you know, made lots of money really fast. But investing isn't that. Investing is, you know, investing slowly over time. And I'll get into... um, 
and I'll write this down so I don't forget, um, <laughs> about what I think, you know, investing in equities um, is basically for. But my first investment, you know, I would have been 18 or 19 years old, maybe less. Yeah. And I got a hot tip and it was some type of agribusiness um, company that they were developing some vaccine for pigs or something like that and they're waiting on government approval and once they got the government approval, they would have the patent and all that stuff and I was basically chasing fast cash yep. and, you know, they didn't get government approval and I did my ass, lost almost 50% of the money. So that was my first example and it's just so different now because realistically you can get invested with $10 but... Yeah. A million years ago, you had to really save up a parcel of $2,000 to make it worth it. Yeah. Um, but since then, you know, I've just, I've had to change my mindset that, and I'll move into what I was talking about before, like investing in shares, I actually don't think it will quote unquote make you rich. Yeah. For me, your human capital the energy you put out there into the world, whether it's your job, your business or whatever, that will always have a bigger investment than any stock return. So for me, investing in ETFs, investing in managed funds, what I've resolved is that's just where I park my money for the long term, for the Glen of tomorrow that has a decent shot of growing and outpacing inflation. So I don't have this mindset anymore that investing or buying a share will make me rich. No, I need to do the best I can to add value to the world, to produce capital, live on less than I earn, and then park the rest for the Glen of tomorrow. Yeah, love it. Yeah, love it. It's uh, spot on. Investing in your own worth as the as the key to generate the income that you can then grow the wealth uh, passively, yeah, or actively, depending on how aggressive you want to be through other other asset classes. That's awesome. So, that, break it down a little bit for us, then, uh, if you're happy to. Yeah. In terms of you know, you, you talked about the. The, the shares initially, what, what else have you invested in and, and what have been the, the highs and lows in that, the, the best investment and the worst investment and the learnings that you've taken from your own personal investment journey so far? Yeah, so my best investment was my business. Uh, you know, year on year, I could produce 30% return. Yeah. So shut up. That's amazing, right? That's and awesome. I had complete control. I was, you know, I didn't, wasn't accountable to anyone, only my clients and helping them. Uh, so that was my best return because year on year, really good profit, really good income for myself. Yeah. And then when I actually uh, merged that business with another business and effectively sold it and took money off the table, uh, that certainly was a great uh, payday. So in terms of that capital, like I actually created that with all my energy and intent, right? Yeah. It wasn't, you know, I put $10,000 in this company and then two years later it was millions of dollars. You know what I mean? Like it's none of that crap. It's literally working hard, being intentional, taking risks over a long period of time. If something's not working, adjust. If something's working, double down. So that was basically uh, probably my best investment to date. And sure, yeah. along the way I've... Um, you know, opportunities. It's funny when you have a little bit of money, opportunities seek you out. And, yes. You know, I get calls over the years from startup companies, developers, and all this stuff. And yeah, I've thrown a bit of cash in, you know, into some developments and doubled my money within X amount of time. And I've done all that fun stuff, highly risky, right? Yeah. Um, but I was at the stage where I could take that risk given I had the capital and I had the risk profile and I understood. So that's kind of the three pillars as well of investing, right? You've got yeah. to have the money, you've got to understand yeah. and you've got to have the right risk profile. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the worst investment, look, gosh, probably inv my the worst investment is bloody screwing up my daily money by spending stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, being impulsive and buying crap I don't need. Like... And none of us are above this stuff. Well, some of the savers out there are because you're perfect. 
Uh, but also, <laughs> you've got to chill out and spend some of your, of your money um, without guilt. But I, yeah, you've just got to win the day. If you win the day, you win the week. You win the week, you win the month. You win the month, you win the year. Uh, it's pretty easy. Just And like even the Glenn James spending plan, we, we do it weekly, right? Yep. So people can just get through this week with only spending this amount of money. Change the habits, change the behaviors. Because the best investment you will make is first in you, in your habits and your behaviors, in your understanding, and then in your mindset. So there's actually nothing that is, um, there's no trade or secrets, trade secrets or anything conspiracy like out there with yep. doing well with your money. Yeah. It's, it's actually uh, good money management and good investing is the most boring thing you could do. If you're looking for excitement, then uh, you're probably not going to make any money. Buy some crypto. <laughs> some yeah. or, or go to the casino or mm. chuck it all on the Melbourne Cup yesterday. Yeah. Uh, same sort of drill. Yeah, and no, I absolutely agree. And I, I, my own, own belief around this, Glenn, is that sustainable success in anything, whatever that is for you, whatever how you define it, lies at the intersection of what I call self, health, and wealth. And self is your mindset and what's between your ears and your outlook on your life and your self-belief and your belief in other things and and uh, your expectations around how things are going to roll. Your health is around the happy habits, daily rituals, and uh, the sort of um, uh, the, the, the day-to-day stuff that you do that, that builds the patience and persistence that then can ultimately contribute to wealth and however you want to define wealth, whether that be business, what you invest in, where you spend your time. Uh, it's that combination and it's a bit like a three-legged stool. If you knock out one leg, then the whole thing falls over. And uh, mm-hmm. I see way too many people focusing on the wealth component but put no energy into the self or the health component and then wonder why they either self-sabotage or don't achieve the the goals they're looking to uh, aspire to. But what's been your experience in that regard, given that you've seen a, a lot of uh, people uh, over the years in your capacity, both as in financial planning and ongoing with what you're doing with the podcast? Yeah, the number one thing that I just see over and over again is just the habits and the behaviours. Like life is just based on our habits. It's just based on our behaviours. It's it's... I just think like there's the book called Atomic Habits by James yes. Clear. Great book. Um, which, you know, the kind of book before that was The Power of the Habit by Charles Dughill, I think his name was, which I yep. read years ago and that started to change my mindset. And then I think Atomic Habits is kind of probably a little bit more practical and uh, easy to implement the idea behind it. But I just think you you just win and lose everything in your life based on your habits and once you have it once you get a habit sorted and you automate stuff like it's fascinating right i was looking at my an example the other day like i opened my super account it's like oh wow put a lot of money in there but it doesn't feel like it because i just pay it monthly yeah like there was another thing i opened I did something and I didn't realize. I think it was like maybe another investment account or something like that. And again, just putting monthly in, monthly amounts in. It's like, oh, wow, that really does build up. And it's just automated in the background. There's a book called The Automatic Millionaire, uh, which is interesting if someone's new to all this journey. Um, but it's just literally, you've just got to get systems and structures in place. And the same way that I built my business with really good systems and processes uh, and good workflow, nothing gets missed. I basically run my cash flow, my personal cash flow, like a lean and agile business. Yeah. Because you want to really be able to adapt and change. You want to really be able to allocate resources over here if there's something that comes up or a spot fire. Uh, You want to be able to really not have things that are tying you down. And I'm working on this thing at the moment. Um, I'm actually putting crap together because I'm like, oh, I might as well write another book that wasn't as hard as I thought. Um, (laughs) And so I'm working on just these kind of talking points and like thought starters. And what I'm um, talking and thinking about lately, I'm calling it like budget baggage. 
And yep. we all have this budget baggage. Well, some of us do uh, that we wake up and we're like, oh, I actually really want to invest in my future. I'm, I'm there. I'm resolved. Oh, but I can't because I've got budget baggage because I made a dumb decision two years ago and got a personal loan for a trip to Ibiza and, you know, I'm still paying that off. Like that budget baggage will hold you back from making changes faster in your life and having an agile budget. And I really think we've got to get to the mindset where when we allocate money in our budget, we have to do it with the mindset of I'm allocating this money for the Glen of the tomorrow, for the bushy of tomorrow, not the Glen of yesterday. And that's the problem with consumerism and society. They want you to tie up your budget for things you've already consumed. Spot on, spot on. Unfortunately, our patience, persistence and discipline muscles have died on the vine in the insta, instant world of everything right now. Mm. And uh, that's that's the biggest challenge I think we have is that while technology has been a, an incredible enabler, it has the, the, the concept of any form of delayed gratification is out the window. So you've got to really swim against the tide uh, of the, you know, the continuous barrage of marketing messages that are saying, have it all now uh, versus uh, <laughs> having the discipline to, and then have the, having the patience and persistence to actually see something through long term. Is, it, is that something that you're seeing a lot across the board? Yeah. And I think what I'm trying to get across to people is like everyone gets tied up with the execution of buying an investment. Everyone gets tied up with what's the best share, what's the best ETF, what's the best property. All that crap will sort itself out. Just focus on having good money habits and behaviors. Just focus on spending less than what you earn. You know, let's not major on the minor. There's lots of good investments. There's lots of good properties to buy. Like the current thing online is, oh, I need to get free brokerage on my share purchase or my ETFs. Like, (laughs) If you're worried about spending $5 to invest $2,000, you got bigger problems. Like you get what you pay for. Nothing's free. Um, if, you know, if you get, oh, I get free international trades with this company here. Well, darling, guess what? They're making a money off the spread of the currency conversion. So yep. you've got to really understand nothing is free. Don't major on the minor. Major on the major. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I've absolutely. To, I get Spoiling. ranty and cynical and people hate me because of it. No, well, that's refreshing, mate. There's not enough of it. There's too, too much uh, smoke and hot air blown around in, in the spheres that you and I uh, swim in. Mm. So uh, a refreshing cut through with a laser-like uh, focus on telling them how it is is uh, exactly how it needs to be, mate. So uh, we don't need to sugarcoat anything in that regard. Mate, tell me, uh, are you happy to put some shape around what your current investment portfolio looks like and it's spread across the different asset classes and, and why you've invested in what for what potential outcome? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I probably won't get into the weeds too much because no. the problem I've found, Bushy, and you may have, may have found the same problem, like if I, if I mention, so I'll mention something on my podcast like, oh, I saw that um, CBA have got some shares that you can buy. Oh, that's cool, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I'll read online somewhere, oh, Glenn says buy CBA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, um, exactly. <laughs> but uh, look, I my financial plan is really simple and I'll, I'll walk you down this garden path. It's a three-point right. financial plan. The first one is live on less than I earn. The second one is be a generous giver. The third one is invest the rest. So we've talked, we've really talked about the whole budgeting thing and live on less than we earn. So it's habits and behaviors. Yeah. Be a generous giver. I think, you know, there's always people worse off. Uh, I give well over 10% of my income away each year. Yeah. Uh, I think it does more for me. It makes me think that I'm no one special. I'm just a bloody bogan living in a house, you know, on the central coast, like nothing special. Uh, so I need that to keep me grounded. And particularly, you know, you walk into a cafe in Perth and someone's like, oh, Glenn, listen to the podcast. Like, that's weird. That's not normal. And <laughs> I can't let that, you know, affect who I am. So part of me being generous and a giver is to help deflate anything that 
elevates me to think I'm better than anyone, but yeah, because I'm not. So I'm really a, a vocal advocate of being generous with your money. And a lot of these online forums and, you know, money groups, it's more of a goal of how much can I amass for myself and, oh, here's my monthly spend. I've spent 30% on this. And it's like giving isn't there. So we have to, you know, if you're fortunate enough to hear this recording, you're probably doing pretty good, like world standards. So, you know, we've all, everything's relative, yes, but let's just chill out for one second and slow down creating wealth for you, you capitalist pigs, and help other people <laughs> first. So... Totally agree. But this is just my vibe, right? Oh, I'm with you. We, we, I talk about there's investors and there's outfesters, Glenn. Yeah. There's a lot of in, investors and you need to invest in yourself first to put you in the position where you're able to outvest. No, no question about that. But uh, oh, and that's I, right. I have, yeah, I, in my own experience, uh, and I, I, I put this back to my good mother, Glenn. Uh, mm. She was the most giving person I've ever come across, uh, just totally selfless in everything she did. Mm. And uh, I hadn't really realised until I started uh, giving myself of just how fulfilling that is, you know, to give to someone uh, without ever expecting anything in return and without them even knowing it. Mm. Uh, there's just a sense of satisfaction that comes out of that, uh, and, and and like you, we we uh, the proceeds of my book go to a charity called Living It Rough and Doing It Tough, which keeps the pets of the homeless together so they've got companionship and they get back on their feet. Uh, the finance component of our business: for every dollar we uh, uh, save. Uh, clients by restructuring their finances. Uh, we donate a, a day's worth of life giving water to uh, families in Tigray, Ethiopia through the B1G1 mm. Foundation, which is buy one, give one. Mm. And, uh, and and therefore we're partnering with others to help each other, but ultimately helping those that have no voice and have no choice, which, uh, you know, we, we just forget how privileged we are in this country. We live in the, the best country at the best time ever. Yeah. And uh, to uh, respect that and, and as you say, yeah, keep our own egos in check. Uh, yeah, and I, I think it's important. important to note that um, anytime I open my trap about giving generosity, people are like, oh, I give my time. Well, that's awesome. You're better than me because I don't give my time because I can do more benefit by just giving money yeah. and, you know, that's a whole other philosophical thing but just I would caution anyone and I actually think I said this in the book you know don't think you know if you say oh I don't give money because I give my time well just because you donated half a day three years ago you're not actually a giver like of your time you volunteered yeah. once but <laughs> so a lot of people use that as this scapegoat to giving with their money um, <laughs> and you know who I'm talking about if you're listening and you know if someone donates a day of their time once a month or once a fortnight, they are a generous giver, right? Straight up. <laughs> but don't just use the crutch of, oh, I give my time when you donated one day of your life two years ago. So back off there. Uh, and secondly, I think I'm loud and clear. I just need to say this, that if you're just getting started and struggling to get your own house in order, we're not saying give your money away. We're not doing that. You know, in the book, I talked about this uh, money hierarchy where we have base, uh, basic comforts, um, well, baseline needs, basic comforts, then basic luxuries, and then the hierarchy goes up. Like if you're just trying to pay rent, feed the kids and, you know, struggle through and get through, we're not asking anyone to give any of their money away. Look after your own house first. Yep. However, you can give a smile. You can cook a meal for someone else. You can give blood. Like it's this all goes back to it's not really about the money. It's about the heart behind it. So spot on, spot on, so exactly anyway, right. I, I, no, get, I, I get ranty, but whatever. No, you don't, mate. It, it, and it, it's extremely well said because uh, and I'm with you. There's just not enough. It's it's all about me, me, me. What can I get out of things? I, 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 rather than we, we, we. How how can we help? help ourselves and and at the same time help others mate and and again i say you people don't appreciate how fulfilling that is until till you actually are giving on a regular and generous basis and, and i would uh, say if you can't remember the last time you were generous it's probably time to pull that trigger 
Yeah. Yeah. Good now, call. The, the third thing. So yeah, live on less than I earn, be a generous giver, and then invest the rest. Well, it's actually I don't really overcook this. Uh, the first thing I do is cap out my super each year. Yeah. Like, would I want? To, would I rather pay fifteen percent or thirty percent tax than forty percent? Hmm. I wonder. Um, <laughs> no brainer. Yep. Yeah, and thankfully, yes, I'm in a position where I can do that. So that's kind of number one. Yep. Cap out my super. Um, that's just in a, a model portfolio. I pay a financial advisor to look after that part of it. Yeah. Uh, because I'm pro advice. I'm pro professional help, and I'm not above this. It will stop me doing something dumb, logging in and doing something. So. It's just that accountability piece with that yeah. side of the coin. I can bounce anything off them. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, I've got, uh, I call it my second super, which is an investment bond, uh, yep. which I put monthly amounts into that each yeah, each month. Yep. Uh, because realistically, you want to keep your mitts off that for over 10 years. Um, and then I've got um, a, a share investing account with self wealth and I just buy things out of personal interest. Like there's a global fund that I like, or like I've got two individual shares. Like I don't actually really buy individual shares. You're great. I wouldn't mind just expanding on that because I'm with you. It's uh, again, picking individual shares. You might as well go to the casino or the races. Yeah. But and that's you... the thing. Like you'll get a result, but is it going to be a good or a bad result? And it's actually fascinating in the book, because I really wanted to make it practical, right? Yeah. There's a diagram there where I profiled three Vanguard funds. So yeah. the uh, Vanguard Diversified Growth Fund, Vanguard Diversified Balanced Fund, and the Vanguard Diversified High Growth Fund. And yeah. then what I did, I put the share price of CBA in there, right? Yeah. Which was much higher than the three diversified funds, right? Yeah. But as a kicker, I put in Westpac's um share price, yep. which was worse off than diversified balance growth. So the whole thing is, what if you pick the wrong bank? Exactly. You would have done your ass. So yep. I keep my single stock allocation to less than 10% of my portfolio Yeah. just so I don't get cute and I've probably got a proclivity to gamify it and, you know, I, yeah, I just really keep that simple you know, most of the money in my uh, like investments is probably the super account is my main equity pot. Yep. Um, and there's probably, I don't know, it's almost probably getting up there actually to be like super uh, in the trust. And sorry, the so I've got a family trust that owns my company and I the only investments that I have in my name are the properties which, you know, for asset protection – yeah. There's a mortgage against them anyway and, you know, yeah. it's a land tax thing. But, um, yeah, so I, yeah, use self-wealth. Um, I, you know, I actually bought some REITs uh, a couple of months ago because they okay. look pretty cheap uh, just out of personal interest. Um, and, again, I, I really don't want to overcook it myself, so I just need you to be careful. Um so, so the focus I'm hearing on all of that, and what's the sort of uh, rough percentage split between your property and the uh, the super and the investment bonds and and what you might have sitting in cash as well? What, what's that sort of look like to you? Oh, it's probably seventy percent property. Yeah, like I've got um, one, two, three properties. Yeah, and I've just put a uh, a deposit down on a fourth. Yep, uh, but that one is um and actually i wasn't ever going to share that you've got me there as a got you a moment <laughs> um see the problem is like on my podcast there's no point me telling people what i do because you just people just want to rip you down so yeah really yes and no yeah i i I'd still think that uh we've got a very much tall poppy syndrome oh, we do, in yeah. australia but it, it doesn't. Um, it still doesn't stop me from from sharing because you know none of us are perfect, Glenn. Yeah, and and that's I mean, like I'll probably share more the concepts rather than the actual amounts. Yeah, of course. Um, because, yeah. because there's a whole thing out there, and and it's not the the listeners who are fans of you. It's the transient people that drop in, listen to one episode, 
Yeah. Oh, this guy's an asshole. He's got three <laughs> properties. Like, you're such an entitled bitch. And I'm like, well, anyone can do it. Mm. Um, but it, anyway. uh, my view of that is if you're not in the ring, then then I'm not interested in what you think. Yeah. So, so, uh, so yeah, I've just purchased an off-the-plan commercial unit um, through the trust uh, yep. for a couple of reasons. I, you know... GST. Is that through self-managed super or outside? Nah, family trust outside yeah. super. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah, not. Okay. I've made the decision that at this time and any foreseeable future, my super fund won't be um, self-managed for property. Yeah. Because I just, I don't want too much property. So yeah. I'm just pumping my super for equities. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, Make, makes up. sense, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's quite refreshing to talk to an ex-financial planner who embraces property, Glenn. That's that, that's rare in itself these days. That well, there's this I, chasm between the property people and the and the equities people, yeah, and I, I've I never totally I've always, don't understand. Me either. I've, I've always embraced both because it's a it's a it's a journey, and uh, there's a transition. I mean, I, my own journey, Glenn. I, I started investing heavily in equities because I had I came from ground zero, uh, early thirties, divorced, had nothing. And I built up a deposit and I knew that I could leverage a lot stronger growth in property. So I then got into property. And at the other end, as I come out of it, I'm moving back into index funds that are giving us a good dividend return because it's all about cash flow now. So, mm. you know, it's not rocket science, uh, but but to ignore an asset class just because you're either getting paid more for talking about the other, it just has never made sense to me. What about yeah, you? Yeah, I'm just, I like investing. I like property. I like equities. I like, I like it all. Um, yeah, so I, um, so yeah, I've, I've got that. Pro- so I've got my home that I live in, two other investment properties, the commercial unit that's off the plan a year down the track, um, which is kind of cool because you just throw ten percent at it and you yep. worry about it in twelve months' time. Yeah, and which I'll probably turn that into my studio. Yeah, uh, but. If I don't, I'll just rent it out. So, because at the moment yep. my studio is in my garage, um, and I've just decided, as long as Glenn James is on this planet, he's not ever having a commercial lease ever again. Yeah, um, that's just a no need. Thing. There's just um, no need for for what you and I do. There, there is no need. But the problem, is, this is the problem that I've got with it. The two commercial landlords that I've had. Have yep. been the biggest assholes in the world, <laughs> and I just don't care for it. And the the agents were incompetent, and I'm like, guys, I'm paying for something, clean the amenities. Like it's just just tight asses who own the properties without a mortgage, and they just think it's a a cash machine. Well, it's like, no, look after people. It's like anyway. Um, yeah. And then I'll probably um, I'm just doing some. Uh, pre uh, pre workups or whatever with the bank at the moment, the broker. Yeah. Um, because I'll probably grab another property this financial year. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm done basically. I mean, I probably would say my single biggest asset is probably my business now. Yeah. So yep. the problem with small business owners and people like me. You've got to take money off the table. You can't just have your business as this is my asset. Yeah. Because too many people, small business owners, they've got no diversification. Their asset is their corner shop, the what they think's worth lots. And yeah, then in to them. Years time when they want to sell, well, yeah. no, it's not. And you've got no money. So yeah. you've got to always take money off the table and invest elsewhere. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. So, Let, let's 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 shift into. Uh, oh, and I also have uh, some cryptocurrencies. Uh, I can't. Well, well right, let, let's talk about that now. Where uh, clearly, if you've got some, then you've got some belief in them. Uh, talk to me around your beliefs around crypto and why you're invested in it. I, I'm just, I'm a bit fascinated. I think. You know, CBA, as re- we're recording this just today, they've come yeah. out and said we're having, we're going to entertain crypto on our apps, right? Yeah. So I just think, look, we don't know where we're going to end up with it, but we're heading in that direction. 
Totally. So I'm just thinking, and this is this is why I'm just not going to do what I did. I remember in 2013, almost clear as day, and I remember because I remember where I was driving from and what car I was in. In 2013, I was like, I've got to go home and throw a grand or two in Bitcoin. I've got to work out. I've heard all this, and I never did it. And the rest is history. But, like, I just <laughs> want to have a small allocation there. So part of it's FOMO. Part of it is it could be something and it will be something. Part of it is I want to be in there for my own uh, community to know what's going on on the scene. Sure. Yeah, great so, great way to learn by having a bit of money. And I guess yeah. my, own, my own view is that, that, yes, it definitely has a future. But at this point in time, I see it as a wild west, and it's very speculative, and that's okay if you're if you're you're throwing money at it that you're happy to lose because it's only a very small portion of your portfolio. Great, but when I hear of people selling properties to stick it all into crypto, then I, I get very nervous because it's very perception driven. Yeah, tri- I'll, I'll probably counter that with two points. Yeah, um, one, I would not suggest people have more than two percent of their net worth allocated yeah. to that highly speculative asset. Yeah. Secondly, I think and believe, and full disclosure, I, I own Bitcoin, I own Ethereum. Yeah. Those two coins are going to be the ones that the institutions are, will be putting their allocation into crypto. So I think at, in terms of the risk spectrum in the crypto sphere, they're pretty much the cash of crypto, quote unquote. Yeah. But if we step back and look at crypto in the investment sphere within itself, it's, you know, and in the book, I actually, um, I did a risk spectrum, you know, mm. like cash, fixed interest, property, shares, all that. And up the top, I've, I was jokingly did like crypto casino or crypto roulette lottery tickets. Like, so it <laughs> is up in that high risk sphere. Yep. Uh, but within that, I think the Bitcoin and Ethereum are the ones that the fund managers are going to put millions of dollars in to tell their super members and all that, that, oh, this portfolio has 2% in uh, cryptocurrency. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but we know one thing. Is anything worth anything if no one's prepared to pay for it? And then secondly, if is anything worth anything if you can't settle a government debt with it? Yeah. Yeah. So, it, it's just more of curiosity interest, a um, bit of FOMO, but I'm not, you know, I'm not out of control and heavily leveraged into it. So yeah, I mean, it's, a, a, it's a great story, a very compelling story, but the underlying fundamentals as an investment, because an investment for me has got to be something that's going to grow in value. It gives you an income stream and, and it's easily saleable. And uh, I'm well, not it's, convinced it's, that it ticks all of those boxes right right now but it will it will at some point well and this is the wild part about it you can actually um take your bitcoin i think it's called BlockFi, and you can actually put it through there yeah. and get interest on it like they loan it out to other people yeah okay yeah so yeah okay i, I think it, it, it's probably just got two of the pillars at the moment easily saleable yep uh growing value yeah maybe yeah um regular income no but i i would say as well you know if you're just getting started and this is the first conversation you've heard about money ever uh firstly i apologize but secondly <laughs> i'd probably say you've got to go back to and you know and in the book there's that thing that i drew called the sound financial house you've still got to do things from the right order you know yeah, totally you're great. not worrying about highly speculative investments um, or, you know, investing in all this crap, if you don't have your budget in order, if you don't have your debt, consumer debt paid off, if you don't have your life insurances and your protection plan sorted, get your wills and estate plan, get your emergency fund, get your goals nailed. If you want to buy a house to live in, we want to focus on that first. If you want to rent vest and do that, well, let's get that nailed first. Then, 100% agree. Then you can go and start doing whatever you want with your money. But the problem is people put the cart before the horse. Yeah, agreed. I, you mentioned the, and I wanted to talk about the uh, sound financial house because I think it's a, it's a great framework 
uh, and, and a very uh, simple framework for people to get their head around and, and to get a sense of what what they need to do first and how they need to build upon it. You, you've sort of skated across some of the key elements there. I wouldn't mind just sort of uh, circling back and then diving in a little bit deeper to some of those key aspects because whether it be a, a millennial that's going through it, I, I talk to plenty that are a lot older than millennials that are still have the same struggles, Glenn, uh, and a lot younger for that matter that, that still have the same struggles because they, they haven't got a framework in their own head as to what they where they need to start and and where that's going to lead them to. Can we just sort of, can I get you to put a little bit more meat around the, the bones of that sound financial house uh, yep. so that uh, people have a pathway? Yeah, so I actually drew this uh, live in front of a client. He came to see me and the, the story's in the book, but I'll loosely paraphrase. It's like, oh, Glenn, I want a financial plan. I want to invest for the future and do all that stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, you're, um, you know, you're in your 30s. That's cool. You you already own two or three properties. Awesome. You're doing well. But when I dug deeper, he had a, a personal loan or a car loan still. He didn't yeah. have a budget. He didn't know how much he was spending. He still lived at home with mummy and daddy and he wanted to invest in shares. He didn't have any insurances to protect his income. You know, it was just ad hoc and sloppy. Yeah. And so I basically said, mate, the problem you've got with respect is you've built your financial house, but not on strong foundations. And then I drew and I just made it up on the spot. It was quite uh, fascinating because it then became the, the cornerstone of my advice practice. <laughs> so I basically drew a house and I drew four foundations and I just made them up. I was like, number one, like you don't have an emergency fund and you're, you've got consumer debt. Number two, you don't have a, a spending plan in place or a budget. You've got no idea what's happening. Number three, you don't have income insurance because your whole strategy of buying all these properties, the banks want to know that you've got a job. If you don't have a job, they won't give you a mortgage. Now, what's going to happen if you lose your job due yep. to accident or illness? At some point, if the crap hits the fan, the bank's going to come knocking for your investment properties and their debt. And thirdly, you've got no wills and estate plan. So don't leave a freaking mess for your family. No, if you love your parents, if you love your family, get a bloody will. Yeah. Anyway, so then I'm like, and then the slab of the house is your super. You got three super funds. You got to like, you got to clean that up. And then I'm like, well, what do you want to do with your life? You, you know, you can't live with mummy and daddy forever. So you got no real goals for your own personal life. And then I drew the roof of the house. I'm like, then the roof of the house is our investments. So the walls of the house, lifestyle goals, you know, do you want to pay down the mortgage to live in? Do you want to buy a house? Do you want to create your own business? Do you want to learn to fly a helicopter? Do you want to, you know, put the kids through private school? Whatever that is. And everyone's got goals. And then at the very top, once we've worked through this, then we say now we need to invest for the future. And, you know, you just... He, it's just like you can't you can't buy an old crappy house that you want to renovate and just take the roof off and put a nice gabled roof off with cedar bloody awnings and all that stuff or whatever the uh, the eaves or something like that. Like <laughs> at some point something's going to go down and you're going to do your ass and waste all your money. Yeah. And it's yeah. often cheaper to do it right from the get-go than having a completely renovated new house, quote unquote, without doing the foundations and the foundations crack, I know what's going to be cheaper. Do it right from the start. Yeah, absolutely, it's a really good good model, and I'd certainly be recommending that uh, readers of uh, any level uh, grab themselves a copy of the book because it, it certainly does give you a really good uh, step by step pathway and 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 debate some of the key issues that. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of noise and, and confusing chaos and the amount of information that's out there around this. I think you've succinctly sort of broken it down to the, the key bits and walked it through. Uh, something I wouldn't mind you sharing with us is mm. your your spin on uh, the, the sort of fire approach with the, the more, I think, appropriate loot approach yeah. that is a great uh, acronym, which I'm, I'm a, a mad acronym and fan because it's much easier to remember those things. Can you expand on that uh, a bit for us? Yeah, so my my whole vibe with the whole fire thing, it's kind of this circular logic. 
where, you know, the hardcore people that I've met in the States and the fire movement did come from the States. Yeah. It was, we're going to work as hard as we can right now, live frugally to invest as much as possible. So then we've got an amount that's invested that can spit out enough for us to live each year. Then we're financially free and we can retire. Yeah. And then what would happen is people would be like, all right, I've achieved fire. Now I can work on my passion project. Now I can start my side hustle. <laughs> I'm like, just start it now. Like live life on your own terms now. Like, and to be complete fiery purist, you might need to amass eight hundred to a million dollars, right? Yep. You're not getting that from market returns in the next 15 years. No way. It's going to come from human capital and hard work. Yep. And if you're earning 80 grand a year, if there's a household of two people earning 130 between the two of them or whatever and there's kids in the mix, I don't think it's actually possible to actually amass that much within that amount of time to generate the capital needed to fire. Uh, or, or the cash flow that flows from those assets either, for that matter. Yeah, so m my whole vibe is um, just live life on your own terms now yep. because you're going to most of the time, like I've met one person in the States who has legitimately fired. Yeah. And they, yeah, and they don't tell you that they both earned, you know, 250 grand each for 10 years and don't have kids until they'll, well, they're in their 30s and still don't have kids. Like, yeah, you know, that's cute and good on them. But the exception isn't the norm. And basically this individual, he literally is just retired. Like in his 30s, retires, <clears throat> excuse me, does the hobbies and all that stuff. Awesome. That'll, that'll last about six months, Glenn. And then well, uh... for some people it, it will last 10 minutes. Like I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm bored. Like... My team get annoyed because, you know, I've done all my tasks and I've got time, I've got money and I just, we use Slack and I do a um, a little huddle with them. I'm like, hey, what's everyone doing? Like, oh, you bored again, Glenn. I'm like, yeah, I got nothing to do. Like it gets to the point where you can't lay on a beach reading a book every day for the rest of your life, most of us. Nah. There's some people who can. Very few. Amazing. So it goes back to. Well, if you want to start your side hustle when you achieve fire, well, life's too short to put up with crap for the next 15 years hating your job. Yeah. Why not just do it now? Yep. <laughs> yeah, be beautifully said, mate. And I, I think that sort of the, the, the loot link back to money and the life on your own terms is a, is a, a really good way to capture that and, and to distinguish that from the fire movement, which you know, like any sort of cultish type exercise uh, attracts those that get, I, I think, too attached to the exercise and don't step back and go, wait a minute, what are we really trying to achieve here? Well, but, that's, um, like I, I'm i like by definition, I'm part of the fire community. I'm in the Facebook groups and all that. Love yep. it. I just yep. don't like the dogma. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the, the principles. I, I love the principles. It's like religion. I love the principle of religion, but as soon as you get man, men and women involved, it, it comes off the rails. Yeah. And I, I see the same thing here because it gets misinterpreted uh, and then people start creating these black and white, you're right, I'm wrong. Uh, I don't think there is any one size fits all exercise. It's all about what, what comes down to the individual need and then adopting principles uh, and processes that that are going to get you there rather than, than being fanatical about it. But tell me, uh, one of the things I'd love to bridge into here, because within the concept of the millennial community in particular, uh, and, and with what we've seen with asset prices uh, and house prices sort of going through the roof over the last 12 months, uh, this, this old crusty nut of affordability gets gets raised again. And I, I, I want to have a chat to you about a concept that, that you know a lot of us have talked about over the years and that's the one of access versus ownership because mm -hmm. i've always adopted the philosophy that anything i own is an asset that's going to increase in value give me an income stream and it's going to be saleable yeah. but i also access lifestyle so you know we were 20 odd years ago we were rent vesters before it was even a thing because it mm -hmm. just made sense to live near the city where we were working and in, invest where we were able to invest 
And we're, we're going to do the same thing at the other end too, Glenn. It's because yeah. our assets are giving us the income uh, and we're bits of gypsies. We love to travel. So we don't yeah. want to be tied down to one location. We want to be able to move from uh, one location to the, the next yeah. without having this heavy weight of a, a non-cash producing asset around our necks. Uh, and I, I just think, you know, if if we can break this sort of uh, almost stigmatised uh, mindset that says you have to own a house as your first exercise and and you must own everything that, that you want rather than access it. So, you know, for us, we, I'd never buy a sports car, but if we go on a holiday, then I'll hire a sports car because I love driving them, but I don't want to have to own it and be precious about it and have it sitting in the garage most of the time. What, what What's your view around this whole... Uh, in, invest in assets and, and access lifestyle approach to life as a better way of overcoming the affordability issues that uh, imposed often by uh, old crusties in, in my boomers generation without it being embraced by millennials and, and the Zeds and everyone else that's involved in it. What's your thoughts? I, I think you just have to have a strategy, however small. That's kind of a bit of my mantra, right? Have a strategy, however small. Yeah. In one of the early parts in the book is I'm, I want to set the, the new agenda for the great Australian dream. And I don't think we should, like, do you have kids, Bushy? Yes, mate, I do. How old are they? 28. Yeah. So an example there, it'd be very hard for you to turn around to your 28-year-old and say, oh, do this because this works where it's like, well, it worked 30 years ago. Yeah. It's a different economy. It's a different vibe. It's all that stuff right now. Right. Yeah. So we can't apply the exact same principles yeah. to a different generation to today. Totally agree. I don't think rent money is dead money, particularly if you've got an allocation to under 30%, 25 is good of your net take home income to income to rent. Yeah. Provided you've got a goal of doing something else with your money. Because you've got to yeah. live somewhere. You gotta so I'm just a fan of you know, the agenda for the Australian new Australian dream is to live life on your own terms. Now, living life on your own terms, it's not um flaffl- uh, flailing around or whatever that word is and you know, just not being intentional and oh, I'll just do this because it feels good. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's get a very clear definition of what we want our life to look like. Let's get a clear way that we can plug in things to that life to let us achieve life on our own terms. Beautifully so said. Yeah. I, I just think it is more about having a plan, however small. And if that is, we love our current job and we don't want to be self-employed, awesome. That's amazing. There's a lot of good jobs out there and a lot of people just want to go to work, add value, get benefit and go home. We've just really got to make sure that we're being ultra intentional with our cash flow because a lot of the time you don't have a, an opportunity for untapped income when you're an employee. So you have to be hyper vigilant around your budget and be hyper intentional. Yeah. Hyper more, so yep. more so than someone who's in a sales role and they've got an uncapped budget and all that stuff and they're still an employee, uh, an uncapped income. So just have to be hyper-intentional and, yeah, you've just got to – I'm working on this other thing at the moment. I'm giving you all my ideas. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a bit of a nerd and like audio and all that and, the, and there's a thing in like um, an audio world called signal-to-noise ratio. Yep. So I've got to work out what's actually the signal and what's noise. So yeah. signal is you actually can buy a house if you want and live in it. Where the noise is, no one will ever be able to afford a house in this market. Yeah. Got to really work out signal versus noise. You yeah. Know, that's, um, that's a real big one. Be- beautifully said, mate. Uh, mate, um, we, I'm going to sort of use that signal versus noise exercise to cut to them the uh, signals on the what I call the ambush round, which are just the, the fast five questions that most podcasts sort of pepper their guests with. So uh, to get your words of wisdom, mate, what's, what's your favourite quote and why? Oh, I like the quote, 
you can choose faith or fear, but only one of them. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Why, so, why is that important to you? Well, I, I just kind of, it was, you know, back in the day, building my own business, you know, not having money when I started it. I was like, we've got a situation here and I can have faith or hope that it will get better or I can live in fear that it's not going to work out. But they yeah. can't coexist in the same sentence or I think Napoleon Hill said uh, faith and fear, they don't make good bedfellows or something like that. Like yeah. only one can exist, so choose one. Yeah, that's an easy easy choice. Uh, I know you're, you, you, the first sentence of your book says, <laughs> I hate reading, uh, but you're a bit of an audio audio book fan what's the top book that you'd recommend people have a listen to and why oh i top book my favorite that i read every couple of years is the dip by seth godin yeah and it's because it's a very short easy read and it's so amazing yeah yeah, he's got this happy knack of just capturing things in stories that uh, cuts out the crap, but you really get the message. But uh, the next question is a little bit left field uh, because there's still a lot of Aussies who believe they pay too much tax and I'm happy to pay because if you're paying tax, you're making money. But uh, what's the top legal thing that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay? Uh, started a business in a unit trust owned by a family trust. Yeah, yeah. Say no more. It's yeah. uh, it's simple as that on that score. But the, it just it speaks to having good advice and good strategy before you go full ham at something. Yeah, because it can totally make agree. a difference between three hundred thousand dollars when you sell it in tax, yeah, or maybe one hundred fifty thousand. So it's yeah. got to again strategy. Strategy, strategy. I, I'm right with you there, mate. Uh, start with the end in mind. Have a very clear direction on where you're heading. And then look at your capacity to bridge the gap and then just start mowing it down day by day, which brings in the habits that you spoke about before. Mm. Back on the investment uh, subject then, uh, what's the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received to date, Glenn? The best, the worst investment advice? Oh, probably it's anecdotal, but like, going to look at homes to buy to live in in suburbs that I liked and the real estate agent going, oh, I'd be make a, I'd make a really good investment property. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're trying to sell the house, mate. Chill out. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> unfortunately, that still happens way too much. Yeah, that's fine. They've got an obligation to act in the best interest of the vendor and sell the property. But I, I wrote in the book that, you know, you can't take strategic property advice from your real estate agent who's trying to sell you a home. And I love agents and I've got lots of friends who are real estate agents. They're just trying to sell the home. <laughs> you, you, you don't ask your hairdresser if you need a haircut, do you, Glenn? No. And what, the best advice? Yeah. Oh, frigging keep your mitts off it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I love it. <laughs> that doesn't need any explanation either. No. Mate. That's That sums it up beautifully. Well, you, you you talked about the importance of habits and I'm right with you there. So I call them happy habits or daily disciplines or rewarding rituals. What's a, what's a personal habit that you believe has contributed most to your investment success today? Just uh, I've removed me from the process, just automatic investment, um, set up my spending plan because it goes back to win the day, you'll win the week. Win the week, you'll win the month. Win the month, you'll win the year. Win the years, you'll win the decade. And you've only got maybe 50 decades of actual good use. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, once you're into your early 20s, like you've just got to keep your bloody mitts off it and don't try and outsmart stuff. Just let it do its thing. And that's the same thing with, you know, setting up the spending plan. My investment success is because I'm, an suspend, because I'm a spender, I've had to learn to be an investor, not a saver because I can't save money. Yeah. So yeah. 
I've got to have my systems and my spending plan in order so I don't blow $300 a week on mindless crap because if the money's not in my account, I won't blow the money. So it just yeah. gets invested. So this ain't rocket surgery. No, one hundred percent, mate. But uh, it, it's that it's the start that stops most people, unfortunately, and uh, it, it's automating that system. I call it the, the we've got a, a kick-ass automatic saver system that uh, does exactly what you're suggesting, removes the uh, the individual and the, the emotion from the exercise and automate it so it looks after itself once you've got it set up. Mm. Uh, again, not rocket science. There's so much technology out there, it's very easy to achieve. Mate, uh, final question, though, that uh, gives you an opportunity to wrap a bow around everything we've spoken about today, uh, and it's a big one. If I gave you a microphone that spoke to every single one of the 7.7 billion odd people that are currently alive in the world and I gave you a minute to talk, what would you suggest they invest in? Themselves. Yep. Yep. Anything further on that? Uh, I don't know, kindness. (laughs) Looking after people. I mean, if I was talking to everyone on the planet, it's just like, well, <laughs> you know, more than half the planet are in dire need. So I would tell them to invest in hope, invest in, a, you know, kindness, invest in the things that money can't buy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's... Um, yeah. No, that, that covers it off. If, if um, you look back on your life to date... And think about your life in the future. What have, what have you invested in the most, and and what, if anything, differently will you invest in in the future? I, yeah. So my kind of major investments have been business, and then probably property, and then, um, you know, equities. I'm yeah. probably more keen to get into the. Uh, venture capital world yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's because my risk profile is high or I like dopamine. Um, (laughs) Probably both. Yeah, probably both, whatever. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting area. I I had Steve Baxter from the Shark Tank on the show just recently and uh, if you look at the stats uh, on that, then it, it is a bit of a roulette game. And I mean, he he spends a hundred thousand dollars minimum on doing due diligence on the companies that he invests in. Mm. Uh, did you know, as a um, you know the the saying that past performance is no indication of future performance? Yeah, there's only one kind of category that that doesn't apply, and that is um, the successful venture capital funds. Yeah, because how it works is it's kind of this self-fulfilling thing that they they know how to pick something on balance that's a winner. Yeah. And then the good companies that are looking for capital to start up, those funds have usually got the first seat at the table anyway. Yeah. Um, so those private equity and venture capital funds, like, uh, you know, past performance is a pretty good indication. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the only carve out of um, that saying in the investment world. Yeah, no, good call. Good and I'm call. happy to be wrong because my comments are worth what anyone paid for them. So, <laughs> Well, we're not giving financial advice on this show, mate. It's just uh, your opinions and my opinions. And uh, I always say that people have got to go and seek out their own professional independent uh, advice when it comes to these things. And, mate, uh, you've been extremely generous on the show today. It is a, The book is a great read. So uh, I'm certainly going to be highlighting uh, that anyone at whatever level, grab yourself a copy of Sort Your Money Out and Get Invested. And I love the Get Invested bit, mate, because uh, and you you wouldn't be Einstein to work out why. Yeah. Uh, But uh, really appreciate that, mate. For those that uh, want to uh, hear more of Glenn, obviously there's the My Millennial uh, Money podcast and all of the, the spring offs from that. Uh, what what's next for you and, and how can listeners uh, get more involved with you moving forward, Glenn? Oh, what's next for me? Probably I want to go through a season of not doing anything, just doing business as usual. Um, yep. You know, I've 
I probably will do a another course online online course for first home buyers. Um, yeah, if, if I don't know if you want to get involved, just listen to our podcast. Google Glenn James, My Millennial Money. Yeah. Follow our Instagram. Join the Facebook group. All the usual crap. Yeah, but yeah. I will say, if there are any of my listeners who are listening to this, get back to work. Stop <laughs> listening to this bloody podcast. <laughs> Well, I know there are some listeners because I was only talking to one of the listeners who reached out to me recently and he's, he was uh, saying that he'd been listening to you, Glenn. So uh, uh, it's a very small world in the space we swim in. Mm. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to catch up with you, mate. Uh, really appreciate you uh, spending some time with Get Invested. Uh, I know that you continue to do great things in the space and to, uh, you know, jointly, uh, if both of us can be helping like-minded uh, time poor professionals around this country to put themselves in a better stead, then uh, we've made the mark and, and the fulfilment that comes with that, mate. So thanks again for your time today. No worries. My pleasure, Bushy. And thanks to all your listeners. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Talk soon. To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. It's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening and as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die forever.